Hello and welcome to We Need to Talk About on GB News with me, Alex Phillips, where we get stuck into the issues that we should be looking at in depth. Nothing is off the table and nobody will be cancelled for saying what they think. Keeping me company today is my former colleague, Brexit Party MEP and businessman Ben Habib. And here's what we've got coming up on the show. As restrictions lift in England, we count the cost of the pandemic and ask if it's finally coming to an end. Prince Andrew causes shock by insisting on a jury trial and says he'll fight Virginia Dufresne's sex abuse allegations in court. We'll have reactions from the UK and the US. And are influencers still hiding the truth from us while they earn thousands flogging products without our knowledge? MPs have been taking evidence. That's what we're talking about for the next hour. But what do you need to talk about? Email me, gbviews at gbnews.uk or tweet me at gbnews. But first, it's time for GB News Headlines with Rosie. Thanks, Alex. A very good afternoon. It's just gone two o'clock. I'm Rosie Wright here to keep you up to date on GB News. The Prime Minister says he will publish the Sue Gray report into alleged lockdown parties in full. He hasn't confirmed, though, when. Opposition leaders have been calling for transparency following suggestions by some cabinet ministers that sections may be redacted for security reasons. Scotland Yard is investigating some of the events, but Number 10 says Boris Johnson hasn't been interviewed by police. Leeds North East MP Fabian Hamilton told GB News Partygate means the Prime Minister should go. My constituents, like every other MP's constituents, are sick to the back teeth of this whole Partygate nonsense. They want a resolution and they want the man that has been at the back of this and the front of this to pack it in, frankly, because if he sets the rules for all of us and then he breaks them willingly and knowingly, which he clearly has, and then lies to the House of Commons about it, which is against all the rules in the book, then he should resign straight away. I'm sorry. Boris Johnson has also rejected claims he intervened to get animals out of Afghanistan, dismissing them as total rhubarb. Former Royal Marine Penn Farthing launched a campaign to evacuate his team and the animals from Kabul when the Taliban seized control in August of last year. The Prime Minister has repeatedly denied approving the rescue effort, despite new evidence suggesting otherwise. Prince Andrew's lawyers have accused Virginia Dufra of wrongful conduct in their latest attempt to dismiss the civil sex abuse case against him. They've submitted 11 reasons why they believe the case should be thrown out. The Duke of York, who's consistently denied the allegations, also wants to appear before a jury to contest the claims. The Sun's former royal correspondent Charles Ray says the outcome won't change, though, how people view him. Despite all this posturing by both sides, the, the, the plaintiff and the defence, you, you've got the situation where this case could end up being settled out of court as 97% of uh, civil actions are settled in America. So it, it, none of it is any good. You know, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, whatever the result is, it's, it's not going to look well for Prince Andrew, even if he's cleared of all these horrible allegations. Nicola Sturgeon has been addressing First Minister's questions. Scottish Conservative leader Douglas Ross quizzed her on what he calls the unworkable and unsafe maternity services. We can find out more and go to Scotland to speak to our reporter there, David Donaldson. David, good afternoon to you. What has Nicola Sturgeon had to say? Well, she was certainly attacked by uh, Douglas Ross, the Tory leader here, uh, about the downgrading of services at Dr Gray's Hospital in Murray back in 2018. That means that uh, pregnant women now have to travel to Aberdeen or to Inverness, and the services there are struggling to cope, according to Mr Ross. An open letter was sent by 18 maternity staff to Hamza Youssef, the Scottish Health Minister as well, uh, to try and address this problem. And we heard some harrowing uh, stories from pregnant women who had had to travel long distances as well. So, yeah, it's something that certainly Nicola Sturgeon needs to think about. She says there's a balance to be found somewhere between providing good services and ensuring that women don't travel so far. Davy, thank you. Now, Russia says tensions with the West over Ukraine are reminiscent of the Cold War. It comes as the US formally rejected Moscow's demand to ban Kiev from NATO. The Kremlin says remarks by the US and NATO do not give much cause for optimism and that it's clear security concerns haven't been considered. 
A ceremony to mark International Holocaust Remembrance Day has been held at the Bundestag in Germany. The German Chancellor, German President and Israel's President laid a wreath at the memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe. The ceremony remembers the millions of people who were killed by the Nazi regime. Chief Executive of the Holocaust Educational Trust, Karen Pollock, told GB News it was a defining period in human history. It may be disturbing for viewers to think about the fact that six million individuals, they were taken away from their homes, put in ghettos, some sent into the forests and shot and thrown into a ditch, some deported to concentration camps and death camps straight to the gas chamber. It is unimaginable. It's very difficult for us to get our heads around. Meanwhile, Prince Charles has described seven portraits of the nation's last remaining Holocaust survivors as a powerful testament to their lived experience. The Prince of Wales commissioned the paintings to serve as a lasting reminder of the horrors of the Nazi regime. You are now up to date here on GB News. I'll bring you more as it happens. Now back to We Need to Talk About with Alex. No face masks, no COVID passes, and no limit on people visiting loved ones in care homes. As England removes the last of its restrictions, it is perhaps poignant that we stop and think about what we went through. The unprecedented horrors of all that we take for granted being torn from us. Humanity itself ransacked of the things that make us human. Not amounts in bank accounts, not selfies on Instagram, not the final word on Twitter, but smiles, hugs, laughter and love. It was these simple exchanges that were sacrificed through face masks and social distancing, restrictions on meeting, touching and bonding. Perhaps it is poignant that today is also Holocaust Memorial Day. I'm not making a direct comparison, but we wonder how it was possible a nation blindly participated in atrocities against humanity. Perhaps the last two years have showed us that we retain that capacity to obey, even when what is being asked of us would once have been unconscionable. We wonder how it was that such hatred was able to divide fellow human beings. Perhaps the last two years have showed us that we retain the capacity to hate, to polarize and to blame. When we wrap ourselves in individualism and play out our priorities through the prism of identity politics and do not stop to question what we do, the divine spark of humanity is tragically obscured. Today, let's remember that we are creatures of love, of compassion, of community. Today, let's remember that while humanity may be deeply flawed and capable of the most monstrous of acts, a simple smile, a fleeting touch and a tender hug, are the greatest weapons we have against the worst of our natures. Well, let's talk to GB News presenter Neil Oliver, who has been charting the impact of the pandemic on our day-to-day -day lives. Neil, fantastic to have you on the programme. I remember that moment when the Queen delivered that incredibly poignant speech to the public saying, we will meet again as we closed our doors on each other. And it felt as if Freedom Day would eventually come with a fanfare and fireworks, but, but that hasn't happened. Do you think we risk not taking stock of lessons to be learned? Uh, hello, Alex. Yes, very much so. That's exactly what I do think. Um, I, I think what's happened in the last two years is profound, uh, and I don't think it will be quickly or easily undone. I think the changes that have been wrought uh, will last for years or longer. You know, who can say? Uh, here in Scotland, for example, uh, after the restrictions are further relaxed, face masks will remain, for example, 
for an, for an unspecified period. Um, I think more than anything else, I, I've just been rattled, I think, discombobulated, to use a, a, an out-of-fashion word, uh, by the extent to which so many people were, were ready uh, to give up essential hard-won freedoms because a government told them to do so. I, I had really believed that here in Britain and across Europe and in North America, Australia, New Zealand, uh, that, that, that people would not accept um, you know, a, a, a Chinese-style authoritarianism as it manifested itself in lockdown and the rest of the restrictions and the way in which government, with barely a nod to parliament, awarded itself draconian powers. Uh, but, but we did. Uh, you know, British society did uh, absorb that. And once you teach a government that it can behave in that way, governments don't forget. It's like muscle memory. If a government has learned that, you know, by declaring an emergency, the people will accept all manner of author authoritarian powers, then future governments will readily and easily find convenient emergencies so that they can bring those restrictions back. Um, I'm, I'm considering this a, a pause, a, a, a time to reflect, as you point out, but I think there, there has been a, a, a fundamental change right down at this, the, the, the subatomic level of society, if you like, uh, and, and changed as we have been, so we will remain changed. Neil, how do we go about creating a, a conversation, a sort of more introspective and social conversation? We are at some point going to have a COVID inquiry. It will be a very administrative exercise. It will look at empirical data. It will sort of weigh up economic costs. But as you said, I mean, it was quite staggering when you reflect the unprecedented measures that we lived under for the last two years. And it seems to me we floated back into this sort of semi-normality without really questioning what went on, how do we do that? How do we now start a national or global conversation? Very good question, very difficult to answer. Uh, I think that, you know, the last two years, they have revealed something bleak. I, I was hearing today, there's a, a campaign group called Rights for Residents that, that is alleging that in care homes at the moment, excess deaths are, are now the result of thirst and starvation. Now, the, the elderly people and, and some of those most at risk are, are, are dying for want of a drink of water or, or, a, or a bowl of soup. And, that, and that, that it's being alleged that that's the case in, in 21st century Britain, I think, says that we're, we're, not, out of the, we're not out of the woods or, or that certain aspects of our society that weren't visible and that have been revealed and made plain in the last couple of years are still to be considered. Um, there, are, there is absolutely, I'm sure there will be, an, uh, there's a need for and there will be some kind of inquiry, but I, I'd be very sceptical about uh, addressing uh, any of the, the sort of fundamentals that, that most preoccupy me. I do think it's a, a fundamental and a philosophical question. I think the way in which so many people uh, submitted to and responded to and, and, and revealed their true natures during the last couple of years it seems to suggest that there's something hollow maybe at the, at the heart of, of society, uh, that there's been a want that was hitherto undeclared and not revealed, but that COVID laid it bare. Uh, and I, I, I do wonder at, at the extent to which we have or had uh, the kind of society or, or community that, that so many of us believed that we had, that so much was surrendered with hardly a backward glance. And even when it began to become apparent after a few months that you know the virus was primarily a threat to the very old and the very ill uh, and that, and we could see that and many of us were predicting that the continuation of lockdown was going to be disastrous lethally disastrous for health for for well-being for the economy in every conceivable way we, so many of us, we just blindly and blithely went on accepting it, and that we did says something. Now, I'm not. It, maybe that is just the case. Maybe, maybe I, I don't actually think that anyone was changed by the last two years. I think people's essential natures were revealed by the last two years. 
And I, th I think a lot of uncomfortable realities and truths were simply laid bare yeah. by the last two years. And for sure, there's a conversation or many conversations that need to be had. Uh, but yeah. like you, I would tend to suspect that, that anything that the, the government will will bring you know, to fill that, that void will be, a, will be bureaucratic and yeah. administrative. I think we need to, we really need to start asking ourselves what kind of society we want to have. And we need yeah. to decide whether the, the uh, institutions that are supposed to hold it up like scaffolding, if they are still fit for purpose. And if not, then, well, there's a whole new basket of conversations that we need to have yeah. in the future. Neil, thank you so much, and thank you for your philosophical wisdom. Wish there's more philosophy in this world, quite frankly, Neil Oliver. Well, let's now ground it in the real world and get a sense of the mood in the care sector, because from Monday there will be no limits on visiting residents in care homes. I'm joined now by clinical lead at St Celia's Care Home in Scarborough, Simon Wall. Simon, what does this mean for you? I mean, you still have a hesitancy, don't you, about lifting restrictions. Can you explain that? I can, Alex. Um, we're still seeing the effects of COVID within the home um, and the effects it's having on our residents, on our staff, uh, the levels that we'd like to keep it at. And I can understand people and we warmly welcome that uh, the visiting is lifted. We wished it was done in a less of a manner than it has been done, where it's quite a sweeping statement that everyone can have freedom to visit whenever and whatever. This virus is still with us. It's still causing undue pressure on the NHS, undue pressure on ourselves in the social care sector. Um, and it, it's still there and causing these problems. So our, our sort of like stance is, yes, we warmly welcome it because um, you're absolutely right in the, in the fact that people can come in, can touch, can hug, can love. Um, you can't do anything with that. It, it's... You can't do a Zoom meeting or a Teams meeting or, or a, you know, something online that's going to allow them even the slightest amount that's close to someone just holding your hand. But we also have to remember that we have to protect our residents. Yes, they are vulnerable. I disagree with the facts from the last gentleman that said it was the elderly and was those with comorbidities because COVID is affecting everybody um, and has different effects on, and, on different people for different reasons. Um, so I think we've still got to have some caution, uh, but we do warmly welcome the fact that we are allowing visitors back in. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting that the entire pandemic has been trying to balance, I suppose, the scientific, the psychological and the social. How have you experienced this through the experiences of your residents? I mean, has it had a hugely detrimental impact on their mental well-being and even their physical health being separated from loved ones? I think for it's different for different people um, because there's people that have capacity, there's those people that suffer with uh, dementia, etc. Um, and they suffer in different ways and people's understanding of what is normal uh, for them and whether or not a visitation makes any difference to them at all because some people don't even recognise their own residents when they could see them frequently. I have no doubt that it ha has had a massive detrimental effect on people's mental health. Um, probably maybe not so much on physical health, but certainly on their mental health needs. And it's been absolute horror to manage within a nursing home to be able to support the people uh, sufficiently so that their mental health is not as bad as what it could have been. Simon Walls, thank you ever so much for joining me and giving us insight of what the pandemic was like for you. Well, let's Thanks. go now to my studio guest, the businessman and former Brexit Party MEP Ben Habib for an economic perspective on this. I mean, it, it, business and the economy has also been hugely impacted, without a doubt, by pandemic restrictions, and it's likely to bring a price that will pay for many, many years to come. Uh, absolutely. I mean, national debt has gone up by somewhere between 500 and 600 billion a third of what it was before the pandemic kicked off. In effect, this government has borrowed more in the last two years than in all of history up to 2005. You know, park that for a moment. And GDP has suffered tremendously. I know that the government ministers who we've been hearing from saying Boris has got the big decisions right recently uh, point to GDP having recovered last year, but actually it's a very different composition GDP now. It's largely state sector uh, sponsored growth, 
um, a lot of the money which they cite is actually government money coming into the, into the economy. Private businesses have, I'm hesitant to use the word decimated because you'll correct me on, on my choice of word, but colloquially, the private sector has been decimated. And, um, you know, millions of people were put on furlough. Um, we had to print money to finance this debt. That effectively devalued the pound in the back pocket of the working classes and the poor at a time when actually levelling up was the main agenda item for the government. Um, it had the opposite effect on the rich because asset values rose as the, as the pound depreciated. So actually the rich got richer, the poorer got poorer. And I think this mountain of difficulties that have been created by lockdown are going to be here for years to come. And you might remember, Alex, you know, before the pandemic kicked off, the Conservative Party used to make a big thing about how they didn't want to leave a legacy of debt for generations to come. Well, they've just, they've just, you know, they've just opened the stalls on that. But was that ethical? Was that excusable, considering the situation we're in? It's the fact that the whole globe basically joined in with the same practices that sort of potentially creates a level playing field between countries uh, when it comes to policy choice. Does that alleviate some of the pain of these decisions? Well, I, I don't think it does. I mean, Neil touched on a really important point. You know, people were very quick to give up their liberties. And this is a policy that emanated in China. It's China that started the lockdowns. And there was much disagreement within the scientific community on how we should tackle the pandemic. Indeed, even the World Health Organization advocated against lockdowns. And we had this brilliant document, the Barrington Declaration, which I'm sure you've read, which basically said right at the outset, eminent scientists, epidemiologists from across the globe came together and said that really we ought to just protect the vulnerable and those who are, uh, are elderly. You know, Simon Walls is naturally concerned about people in his care home, and, and he's right to be, because the average age of death from COVID is over the average age of life expectancy. You know, the average age from death is over 80 years of, uh, uh, you know, is over 80 years old. So we didn't, we didn't take a pragmatic approach. We got on the coattails of China. We adopted these incredibly illiberal policies to fight this pandemic without a second thought, actually. We just got on that bandwagon. Mm. And, um, and, uh, and the only way, in fact, we could have done it, the only way we could afford to do it is by borrowing big and printing money. And at the heart of this debate, I think we might talk about it in a moment, but at the heart of this debate is the democratic deficit that lockdown has created. And that democratic deficit would have been incapable of being created mm. if they hadn't printed money. And effectively, what we've done is what banana republics across the globe have done for many, many years, which is to, to strip people of their civil liberties, print money, keep them locked up at home, and keep them satisfied with whatever depreciating value of currency they have in their back pocket. Ben, thank you very much. Well, there we are. We've really got stuck into this one, haven't we? And with restrictions in England finally being lifted, maybe it is time we take stock. And I want to know your views on this. And there's a lot to cover. I'm asking, with those restrictions being lifted, is it the end of the pandemic? Was it all worth it? Email me, gbviews at gbnews.uk. Or you can tweet us, of course, at gbnews. Let me know what you think. You're with GB News on TV and, of course, DAB Radio. DAB Radio will be back with the latest on Prince Andrew's shock decision to call for a jury trial over the sex abuse claims. But first, it's time for a short break and a check on the weather forecast back in a moment. Hello again. Once the last of the cloud and drizzle clears the south, it's a brighter day for many with some sunshine, but there will be further blustery showers across northern parts of the country, especially northern Scotland. Low pressure is departing into Scandinavia. High pressure is starting to move away from the UK, and this trailing cold front is bringing in an area of cloud and some outbreaks of generally light rain and drizzle, mostly for Devon and Cornwall, and for parts of Cornwall that sticks around until the end of the afternoon. But brighter skies follow for the rest of the country with some sunny spells. One or two showers for northern England, southern Scotland, northern Ireland. But the bulk of the showers will be across central and northern Scotland, where it will continue to be windy. And those showers will be accompanied by cold air. So the risk of sleet, snow and hail for Shetland and for the hills of northern Scotland. But the showers in most places ease through the evening. One or two continue for the northern isles. Otherwise, it's a dry with uh, clear skies kind of nights and with winds dropping away. 
or temperatures will also fall and a frost is expected in many parts. In some sheltered spots, minus three or minus four Celsius for central and southern UK, a touch of frost also for eastern Scotland, northern England. A few fog patches first thing, particularly around south, southern and southwestern parts of England, East Wales into East Anglia. They'll continue into mid-morning in some spots, but then they'll lift to brighter skies. But cloud is filtering in from the northwest and that cloud will bring some spots of drizzle over western hills and coasts and more persistent rain in the far north and northwest. A milder day to come in the north, but a slightly colder day to come further south. And that cloud becomes more extensive into Friday evening. The winds pick up in the far north once again and the rain turns heavy, especially for the northwest highlands where as much as 60 to 80 millimetres is expected by the end of Friday. A windy period then for the weekend, especially in the north with the risk of gales and further rain at times drier further south. Hello there, I'm Eamon. And I'm Isabel. And you're watching the GB News digital stream across the United Kingdom. And around the world. If you're here in the UK, you can also watch us on your TV screen. GB News is Freeview Channel 236. On Sky, we're Channel 515. 626 on Virgin Media. Just remember, you might need to retune your TV to watch the channel. Yeah, and if you are doing that, find out more about retuning by going to gbnews.uk. Join my show, Farage, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. We're over a drink. We have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Dan Wooten, join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. Welcome back. You're with Alex Phillips on GB News. It came as a shock to many that when Prince Andrew finally showed his hand in the ongoing legal battle with Jeffrey Epstein's accuser, Virginia Giuffre, that he went in, all in. His lawyers have stated that the prince wants to go in front of a jury to contest the claims brought against him. Foolhardy misplaced confidence? Or a man convinced of his innocence, hell-bent on exoneration? In history... When royals have locked horns with lawmakers, heads have literally rolled. Now, while the spectacle of HRH in the dock will not result in the fate that befell the House of Stuart, could it yet prove to be a turning point in the status and the perception of the House of Windsor? Well, joining us now is GB News Home and Security Editor Mark White. Mark, this is a very surprising development in Prince Andrew's case. Yes, a very much a statement of intent, I think, from Prince Andrew and his legal team that they intend to fight the allegations being put forward by Virginia Giuffre in her civil lawsuit against Prince Andrew, claiming that he forced her to have sex with him some two decades ago when she was underage at that time. She claims that the prince uh, forced her into sexual encounters in Jeffrey Epstein's mansion in New York on Mr Epstein's holiday island and in a home owned by Gillian Maxwell as well. Now this is something that Prince Andrew vehemently denies. Uh, in legal papers that were put before the courts in New York, 
Uh, they said that they intend to contest that. Other issues of this case they intend to contest as well about uh, uh, the issue of whether this should ever go to the courts in the first place. One, because of the fact that Virginia Dufresne lives uh, in Australia. The other, that she, of course, signed that agreement with Jeffrey Epstein. So a number of different areas that they intend to attack this case on. In terms of demanding that this case is heard by a jury, well, I think it was always going to be that anyway. This uh, civil case, when it went before the courts, would be heard by uh, a jury. Uh, and of course, it is, we're told, scheduled for September of this year. I think it's likely that it will knock on until next year uh, sometime while they get all the facts together. We've still got the disclosure phase to come where we'll get a better idea of the kind of evidence that Virginia Dufre plans to put before the court and indeed what the rebuttal might be uh, from the prince and his legal team. It's the last thing, of course, that the royal family want in the run-up to uh, well, what is going to be a very significant jubilee year for the Queen. Uh, but that is where we are. We've seen a few people here today. Alex here for the changing of the guard, braving the cold. There's one gentleman actually just spoke to me uh, just now, said he was a big fan of GB News, in particular Alex Phillips, he says. Talks a lot of sense, he says. I said, are you sure you've got the right show and the right presenter? But he was adamant. You talk a lot of sense. Oh, Mark, thank you. Are you, you making up for being a bit naughty yesterday and pulling my leg? <laughs> thank you for the update, Mark White, our Home and Security Editor. Well, I'm delighted to now be joined by US-based royal commentator Kinsey Schofield. Kinsey, I mean, when you have big court cases in America, they can be quite a big public spectacle, can't they? I mean, what, what do we expect if, if Prince Andrew is indeed hauled up into the dock? Oh, we've lost, we've lost Kinsey there. You know, it was all going so swimmingly, wasn't it? And then a tech bug. We were trying to get her from America, of course, and it's a long way for a signal to travel, isn't it? You're with GB News on TV and DAB Radio. Now, after the break, Ben is back to discuss party gates. Did Boris Johnson do enough yesterday to save his skin? But now it's time for a check on the news headlines with Rosie. Thanks, Alex. It's 2.32. I'm Rosie Wright here to get you up to date on GB News. The Prime Minister has dismissed claims he intervened to get animals out of Afghanistan as total rhubarb. The former Royal Marine Penfarthing launched a campaign to evacuate his team and his animals from Kabul when the Taliban seized control in August last year. Well, the Prime Minister has repeatedly denied approving the rescue effort, despite new evidence suggesting otherwise. That is absolutely, this whole thing is, is, is total rhubarb. Uh, I, I was very proud of what uh, our armed services did uh, with op pitting. And it was a, an amazing thing to, to move 15,000 people out of, of Kabul in, in the way that we did. Uh, I thought it was also additionally uh, very good that we were able to help uh, those vets uh, who, who came out uh, as well. The Prime Minister also says he'll publish the Sue Gray report into alleged lockdown parties in full, but he hasn't confirmed when. Opposition leaders have been calling for the transparency following suggestions by some cabinet ministers that sections of the report may be redacted for security reasons. Scotland Yard is investigating some of the events, but Number 10 says the Prime Minister hasn't been interviewed by police. Prince Andrew's lawyers have accused Virginia Dufre of wrongful conduct in their latest attempt to dismiss the civil sex abuse case against him. They've submitted 11 reasons why they believe the case should be thrown out. The Duke of York has consistently denied the allegations. Russia says tensions with the West over Ukraine are reminiscent of the Cold War. It comes as the US formally rejected Moscow's demand to ban Kiev from NATO. The Kremlin says remarks by the US and NATO do not give much cause for optimism, and it's clear its security concerns haven't been considered. You are now up to date here on GB News. We're on your TV, online and DAB Plus radio. A short break now, and then we're back to We Need to Talk About with Alex.
Hello there, I'm Eamon. And I'm Isabel. And you're watching the GB News digital stream across the United Kingdom. And around the world. If you're here in the UK, you can also watch us on your TV screen. GB News is Freeview Channel 236. On Sky, we're Channel 515. 626 on Virgin Media. Just remember, you might need to retune your TV to watch the channel. Yeah, and if you are doing that, find out more about retuning by going to gbnews.uk. Join my show, Farrar, 7 p.m. till 8 p.m. Monday through Thursday. And there you will get opinion, analysis, debate, and I'll cover stories that nobody else dares to touch. And then for the last 15 minutes, talking pints. Well, over a drink, we have a civilized conversation with someone. We very often disagree, but we do it in a grown-up way. Come and join me on Farage. Dan Wooten, join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. Welcome back to GB News. The fate of the Prime Minister remains in the balance as the much-anticipated Sue Gray report goes unpublished for yet another day. With Boris Johnson's back on the ropes, now with the added ignominy of accusations that he personally enabled a plane of stray dogs to be evacuated in the middle of a humanitarian crisis in Kabul, the vultures are circling and the bargaining has begun. Drop the tax hike for our support. Sack your officials if you want our backing. Bringing down Boris means bringing down Brexit. The fact that the Prime Minister is so evidently compromised begs the question of whether a leader in such a weak position can carry on in his role. Now, with some of his most stalwart supporters even floating the idea of a general election if he's toppled, no doubt to scare those Conservatives with uh, small majorities, the clock is ticking down to something we just don't know what yet. Well, let's take a look at some of the most damaging party claims and how they've been reported in the papers. The Guardian published a photo of multiple Downing Street staff, including the Prime Minister and his wife, appearing to socialise with wine in May 2020. Five days later, the infamous Bring Your Own Bottle Party, over 100 staff were allegedly invited and the Prime Minister was there for nearly half an hour. Carrie Johnson was pictured with a friend in September 2020. Days before, Mr Johnson had told the public to keep their distance from those they don't live with. Then, the Christmas parties. First, the PM was revealed to have hosted a quiz while seated with colleagues clearly in a festive mood. Then, as revealed by ITV, number 10 staff were caught on camera joking about a Christmas party attended by around 40 people. Perhaps most damning of all, the evening before Prince Philip's funeral last year, when the Queen sat alone to mourn, two raucous parties were held inside number 10. Well, I'm delighted to now be joined by Chairman of the Bow Group, Ben harris Quinney. Ben, do you think Boris Johnson has done enough to hang on to his leadership, or will this sequence of peccadilloes and scandals mire the rest of his tenure if he does stay in position? Well, I certainly don't think he's he's done enough yet, but I do think it's very interesting that Prime Minister's question time is supposed to be uh, when the Prime Minister is on the ropes, when he is being challenged on uh, all of the things he's doing, and of course, a time of scandal when he's being challenged about the scandals. And what seems to happen is that Prime Minister's question time is actually the high point 
of, of what is going on with Boris at the moment. He gives a good performance. Keir Starmer fails to land any serious blows. But then after that, we descend into, uh, again, a, a cycle of uh, more scandals coming out and sort of ludicrous excuses and perhaps not the best spokespeople being put forward um, for, uh, for, for the defence of the government. Um, and, and that really draws a big question over the Prime Minister's advisers. But one of the things that I think is most interesting, which has been generally missed uh, in, this, in this Partygate scandal, is that if you look at the Prime Minister's unfavourability rating, um, it dropped far more significantly in 2020 than it has over Partygate. So in the in the second six months of 2020, he lost almost 30 points in terms of unfavorability rating. It went from the 30s to now the 70s, which, you know, 70% of people uh, have an unfavorable view of Boris Johnson, which is bad. But the Partygate scandal only accounts for about 12% of that rise in in unfavorability rating. So it's only about a quarter of what the public see as the problem. And I think the much bigger part of the problem is that Boris just has not been delivering on that mandate that he ran on, both in terms of his leadership election and in terms of the 2019 election to deliver a patriotic, conservative, Brexiteer government. That's, I think, the bigger part of the problem. Not to deny the significance of the, of the party gate, but I think what's happening happening is he's losing his base um, and that's far more serious. I mean, you talk about the Prime Minister failing to deliver on his mandate. One might be able to excuse him a very pregnant pause with the pandemic to cash in on post-Brexit dividends. But have we not now got the problem that political animals have smelt blood and they want to go for the jugular? So instead of getting on with the business of delivering that mandate, of levelling up, of actually making a really good deal out of Brexit, they're all circling and plotting and planning and, you know, going on manoeuvres, basically, rather than running the country. Well, look, that's politics. If you if you fall into scandal, then people are going to take advantage. And, and, and as the prime minister said in prime minister's question time, you know, of course, Keir Starmer wants him to resign. That's Keir Starmer's job. So you're going to get all that. But in terms of delivering on the agenda uh, and look, yes, there's been a global pandemic, but that doesn't answer the question of why is the government pushing ahead with these crazy net zero policies that are going to bankrupt the country? Why? Are we having more immigrants coming into the country now than we were before Brexit? Um, why isn't the government doing anything about illegal immigration? Because, you know, mass immigration is a problem in itself. 750,000 people came into the country legally in 2020, and you've got illegal immigration on top of that. And why is a Conservative Prime Minister hiking taxes to the highest point since World War II? Uh, despite, as has been discussed many times on GB News, there's there's no need particularly for that national insurance rise because uh, the Exchequer has taken in 12 billion or 13 billion more than it thought. So I don't think you can say, well, it's because they've been focused on the pandemic, because they've been doing a lot of unconservative things. It's not just that they've been doing nothing, it's that they've been moving backwards on the conservative agenda. And you can look at social issues as well and having organisations like Stonewall headline the Conservative Party conference and stupid unforced errors like that that just turn the base off. Then on top of that, you've got all the scandals and the party gate and, and this sort of flying pets out of Afghanistan before people uh, nonsense. And so, um, look, the pandemic's been a very, very tough time for everyone. It's been a tough time for the government. Mistakes were made, but mistakes were made everywhere on that. And, and you know, you've, you've got to take that into account, certainly. But I don't think it explains all the other stuff that I've just mentioned. And I think what needs to happen now, if Boris Johnson is to stay, is he needs a gold standard conservative inside number 10, like a Lord Frost or a John Redwood running mm -hmm. things, who's not going to take any nonsense. And that the base, that Brexiteer base that delivered the largest majority since Margaret Thatcher is going to trust that person to deliver uh, on the terms they were elected to. Ben Harris Quinney, thank you so much for your insight. That's Ben Harris Quinney, who is, of course, chairman of the Bow Group. Now, Ben Habib is still with us. So from one Ben to another, it's interesting. So the Prime Minister's in a weak position and those people who have their particular ideologies or hobby horses are now being able to use it to try and extract from him what they want. Could this potentially turn out to be a benefit to Brexiteers like us who are saying, you've not done anything with this, put your foot on the gas and perhaps a beleaguered Boris maybe is what we need to finally get on with getting Brexit delivered? I, I mean, a beleaguered Boris in the last few days has delivered a lot more um, hasn't he? You know, he's scrapped um, uh, Plan B, we're getting back to normal. 
He talks about being much more of a conservative, a traditional conservative. But Ben um, Harris Queenie has hit the nail right on the head. From the word go, uh, Boris Johnson has not been the conservative prime minister for whom the country voted. I nearly said me. I didn't vote for him, by the way. <laughs> but uh, I voted for the... Bre I, I, in fact, I, I can't say what I did on, on, on my ballot paper. But he hasn't been the conservative prime minister that we would wish him to be. And we've got the largest state since World War II. We've got the highest taxes since World War II. And as we emerge from this hugely economically damaging lockdown period, he's raising taxes. And he's not just raising taxes on the rich. He's raising taxes on the working class. This increase in national insurance um, is going to... It's a regressive tax. It hits the working class the hardest. The very people in the red wall seats that gave him the majority that he's got are being penalised for electing him. And that was a manifesto pledge he's broken. And those of us who are close to Brexit know he hasn't delivered Brexit either. He said the entire, United, the entire country would leave the EU as one United Kingdom. But we've left Northern Ireland very significantly behind. We haven't regained our fishing rights. We haven't got proper control of our borders. We've become the first country in history to partition ourselves without a single shot being fired, just at the behest of the European Union. And then on top of that, He's got this crazy uh, net zero, uh, you know, becoming the Saudi Arabia of wind. I mean, it's quite amusing, but it's not the way you govern a country. And the cost of net zero is going to be one and a half trillion by 2050. That's 35 billion a year, every year between now and 2050. And again, that's regressive. It's, it's going to be a tax that hits the working classes the hardest. So out of the window has gone his central policy of levelling up the country. But just coming back to the political point, I think Boris Johnson is now in a, a dance with the grim reaper of his political career. And the reason I say that is that in order to distance himself from Partygate, in order to distance himself from all this scandal that seems to dog him, he's going to have to sack people. He's going to have to lay blame elsewhere. And the corpses of his enemies in the parliamentary party. And that's what matters right now. It's not really what the people think right now that matters. It's what the Conservative parliamentary party think. And the corpses are piling up. And his enemies are rising. And they are going to take him out. We saw this with John Major, for those of us who are old enough to remember John Major. He had this protracted dance with the Grim Reaper of his political career. But eventually, they knifed him. And that is what it, that is going to happen to Boris Johnson. It's not a matter of if; it's just a matter of when. And I think we're talking about potentially weeks, uh, possibly months. They may wait until after the May elections just to see how they they, they go. But I think he is political toast. Wow! And, and some very vivid uh, imagery there, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> You've been emailing us your views about COVID restrictions. Of course, we had a very in-depth conversation on various fronts, uh, two years on, essentially, from when restrictions were put in place. Of, was it all worth it? Tony says, when several government members have not abided by the rules, it makes it a mockery. People are questioning the way the government acted. This is why Boris has to go. Mike says... I find it really hard not seeing my wife during lockdowns as she is in a care home. I'm sorry, Mike. There were no daily hugs. She was surrounded by people in masks and no smiles. It meant nothing to my wife seeing me via Skype on a tablet whenever there was a signal. That's really, I'm so sorry, Mike, and I, I, I do hope you get to treasure your time with her now. Paul says the restrictions were not worth it. All the other health ailments like cancer that have fallen by the wayside will be felt for years to come. The mental health crisis, the economic debt crisis, and now the inflation crisis. Yeah, we're going to be paying the price for COVID for a long time indeed. Ian says, great damage has been done to our civil liberties and freedoms over the last two years. Those lockdown measures, including the failed COVID passes, have failed miserably. Thank you for your thoughts on that topic. Keep them coming in, gbviews at gbnews.uk. Now, the World Wide Web has ushered in an entirely new culture and a whole new slate of opportunities that few of us have really not learned how to truly seize. One such product of life online is the rise of the so-called influencer. Where once our ambassadors, celebrities and change makers came through professional industries on regulated platforms, 
Today, anybody can attempt to be anything, sell anything, and promote anything entirely autonomously. Is that a good thing? An inquiry in Parliament today examines the power of influences on social media in the absence of any real regulation. With research showing that more than three quarters buried their disclosures within their posts, is it time that those with such a powerful reach are made to abide by the expectations and standards others in public life must uphold? Well, joining me now on the show is junior doctor and influencer, Dr. Ethan Smallwood. Ethan, great to have you on board. I don't get this whole influencer thing at all. How did you get into it? Yeah, well, thank you first for having me on. So, yeah, influencing for me, it was it was something I initially just got into um, in medical school. So this was all the way back in 2016 when I first started medical training. And the primary reason for doing that was just that the resource at the time just weren't there for either people at medical school or for people that wanted to study medicine in the future. And then as I've really progressed through medical school over those years and my clinical knowledge you know, began to grow, I then tried to find areas and topics I was really passionate within medicine and then I could help to you know, influence people and get the right information out there. I mean, is there a risk, actually, that being an influencer becomes a distraction? I mean, being a junior doctor is extremely busy. Or do you see it as an opportunity to disseminate your hard-earned skills and, and, and medical wisdom to a far greater audience? I think both points are absolutely right. I think it can be a distraction if it's used in the wrong way. Um, but on your second point, I think something that I really wanted to do was not just impact the patients I'm seeing every day in hospital, but also the people that aren't coming into hospital in that particular day or week. And so, you know, I can see patients day to day. Then also I can try and influence good uh, public health awareness campaigns and, and similar um, on the weekends or, you know, outside of my day job. Do you get paid for your influencing work through various sponsorships and, and promoting certain goods? And if you do, which one pays better, NHS or Instagram? <laughs> So I think, yeah, so for certain campaigns, they will be paid. For certain ones, they won't be. Um, I think the main, the main thing that I abide by is to make sure I'm working with brands that, that agree with the message that I want to promote morally. And so if I can work with a brand that can promote a good message and bring you know, correct information out there, then I'm happy to work with them. Um, but they're definitely far fewer than my day job in NHS. Now, do you think it's right that the government are putting a big question mark over this practice and saying that, you know, if you advertise on television, on radio, in newspapers, you have to abide by certain rules when it comes to advertising standards, but one third of influencers are actually not disclosing that they're being paid to promote certain products and therefore are not actually beholden to the same responsibilities as perhaps people on other platforms. Do you welcome regulation? I think it's a really good question. I absolutely do welcome it. So I think for myself, I've always upheld those values anyway, because of course I've got, you know, I need to um, be accountable and have integrity for my patients, my colleagues, and obviously the general medical council as well. Um, but while I might do that in, you know, cert certain other people might not do that. And so if we can bring some more formal regulation into effect, I think that can only be a good thing. Thank you so much, Ethan. Dr. Ethan Small there. You might know him from Instagram if you are a follower of various influencers. Thank you so much. Well, let's round today's programme off where we started and go back to my guest Ben Habib on the COVID pandemic and today's lifting of restrictions. What are the lessons to be learned briefly, Ben? Well, I think the lesson to be learned is not to give in to um, a dogma without exploring all options before going into it. And if you are, if a government is thinking about taking these kind of draconian measures that have been taken over the last two years, there's got to be an opportunity for the people to have some kind of say in it. Um, you know, the Prime Minister often draws a parallel between World War II and the hardships that we face in this pandemic. And it's poignant, as you said, that we remember Holocaust today. But World War II and the way we've dealt with this pandemic actually are diametrically opposed. In World War II, people gave up their lives to protect their civil liberties. Now, we're protecting our lives and giving up our civil liberties, readily giving them up. 
And there has to be much more debate about that. And I think there's also got to be checks and balances on what the government does with sterling. Because if we allow our government to print money the way they have, it allows them to take extreme policy measures, which creates this democratic deficit. Now, it's not the first time a government has printed money. We did it in 2008 onwards to save, um, save our economy then from the credit crunch. But we didn't have a majority government. And we've seen what a large majority, how pernicious a large majority can be if QE is in their hands. Ben Habib, thank you so much for joining me today. It's been an absolute pleasure. And didn't he put it so beautifully? Once upon a time, we gave up our lives to protect our civil liberties in the pandemic. We gave up our civil liberties to protect lives. I couldn't have put it better myself. That's about it for me. Join me again tomorrow for We Need to Talk About. Same time, same place here on GB News tomorrow. Coming up next, it's The Briefing with Darren McCaffrey. But first, it's time for the weather forecast. Bye-bye. Hello again. Once the last of the cloud and drizzle clears the south, it's a brighter day for many with some sunshine, but there will be further blustery showers across northern parts of the country, especially northern Scotland. Low pressure is departing into Scandinavia. High pressure is starting to move away from the UK, and this trailing cold front is bringing in an area of cloud and some outbreaks of generally light rain and drizzle, mostly for Devon and Cornwall, and for parts of Cornwall, that sticks around until the end of the afternoon. But brighter skies follow for the rest of the country with some sunny spells. One or two showers for northern England, southern Scotland, northern Ireland, but the Baltic